and the rewards of fasting. Uh, I'm going to talk about just a couple of them because he mentioned a lot of them. Uh, just a couple of them off the top are healing, finances, more God, freedom and power over demonic spirits, authority over sin and bondage, healing and, or, and faith uh, will increase. I just picked a few of them, uh, healing, finances, and more God. Um, healing, he talked about scriptures where he said when we go to fasting where it brings healings to our body. And uh, so instead of going to scripture, since he went to scripture already, I went online and just searched uh, some medical stuff. And here's some uh, results I got. Uh, this is word for word from the Chicago Tribune. Um, it was under health. And it says, <clears throat> give your body a rest. We take vacations. We have weekends off from work. We rest when we are tired through sleep. We take a break to rejuvenate uh, from stress. One thing, though, that we hardly ever do is take a break from food for longer lengths of time. Our digestive system is very busy and hardworking, which requires high amounts of energy. In fact, the digestive system can even drain energy needed for healing, repair, and general maintenance of the body. Therefore, it makes it sense to give it a vacation once in a while. Fasting is a message to your body that you're embarking on a new beginning, flushing out the old and bringing in the new. Fasting is a perfect way to introduce new healthy habits and food into your life. It can give you that jump start, boost, clarity, and clear your body towards shifting things in a more positive direction. Make a resolution to give your digestive system a break once in a while. What better way to start a new year? They forgot about God and that whole fasting thing. That was just a, uh, that was just a secular fast. That was just saying, was standing for food. So they just asked you to start yourself. Uh, that's pretty much what they asked you to do there. But when you put God into fasting, even more healing will come about. But right there it says uh, it actually you does physical healing to your body, just the act you of fasting alone. Now. And another article, The Health Benefits of Fasting by Will Carl off the internet. I, I don't remember what this one was. But he says, finally, the most scientifically proven advantage of fasting is freedom of rejuven uh, rejuvenation and extended life expectancy. Part of this phenomenon is caused by a number of benefits mentioned above, which is a big old paragraph, uh, not a paragraph, a big paragraph. No, it was a big article there. And so it says, it's caused by a number of the benefits mentioned above. A slower metabolic rate, more efficient protein production, detoxification is the foremost argument presented by advocates of fasting. Det detoxification is a normal body process of eliminating or neutralizing toxins yeah. through the uh. colon, liver, kidneys, lungs, lymph glands, and skin. This process is by fasting because when food is no yeah. longer entering the body, the body turns fat reserves for energy and an improved immune, uh, immune system and the increased production of hormones contributes to a long-term benefits of fasting in addition to the human growth hormone that is released more frequently during a fast and anti-aging hormone is also produced more efficiently. The only reliable way to ex extend the lifespan of a mammal is under nutrition without malnutrition. A study was performed on earthworms that demonstrated the extension of life due to fasting. The experiment was performed in the 1930s by isolating one worm and putting it in a cycle of fasting and feeding. The isolated worm outlasts its relatives by 19 generations while still maintaining its youthful uh, physiological traits. The worm was able to survive on its own tissue for months. Once the size of the worm began to decrease, the scientists would resume feeding it, which point it showed great vigor and energy. The lifespan extensions of these worms was equivalent of keeping a man alive for 600 to 700 years. And in conclusion, it seems that there are many reasons to consider fasting as a benefit to one's health. The body rids itself of toxins that have built up in our fat stores throughout the years. The body heals itself, repairs all the damaged organs during a fast. And finally, there is good evidence to show that regular fasting contributes to a longer life. However, many doctors warn against fasting for extended periods of time without supervision. So those are some interesting facts there. Just... Uh, the, the act of fasting alone is healthy. Uh, <laughs> imagine that. Um, as I was also researching, I came across some other things, and it said alternative day fastings, or ADF, 
and this was in terms of food, not a biblical fast again, it was just in a second little bit. What they would do is eat normal one day, and then the next day they would eat a lower calorie diet. Women would eat 500 calories, and men would eat 600 calories. And they found out that um, by doing this, it dramatically improved, uh, or actually improved lower weight and health. Um, so right there, it was just saying that uh, obviously not starving yourself, but going with this kind of diet is actually healthy for you. But now if we add God and scripture reading and prayer into this, we can see where even more healings can come from. We have supernatural hearing, hearing, yeah, if that's what we need. Uh, and other healings will come from. If we can make a biblical fasting a part of our lives, we can live healthier, stronger, and longer lives for God and come closer to God at the same time. Uh, sometimes when I first heard fasting, I saw God as a bully. He wants me to go without food for what? For prayer time? I can pray and eat at the same time. I pray before I eat too and after if I need to. But <laughs> that is exactly what he's saying to do. Don't eat. Seek me instead. And it will bring healing to your body. God is the creator. We need to remember that. When we see scientific reports that state that fasting is good, it should be, well, duh. It already stated in the Bible that it was good. <laughs> so why do we need scientific proof that it's healthy for us? What we need to do is look at the Bible for proof and see whether their scientific reports were true or not by looking at the Bible. Because if you look at the Bible, it says that the earth was round a long time ago. It says God's outside the circle. And the Christian book, oh, hey, the world's actually round. <laughs> they should have just the Bible was already written. That was just a side note. <laughs> But in a sense, it's like, uh, good job, scientist. Uh, you've just uh, stated the obvious. Uh, it's been stated, like I said, over 2,000 plus years ago in Daniel 1, 8 through 16 in the New Living Translation. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to them by the king. He asked the chef of staff for permission not to eat the unacceptable foods. Now, God had given the chef of staff, both respect and affection for Daniel. But he responded, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has ordered you to eat the food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the others, youth of your age, I am afraid the king will behead me. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been anointed by the chef of staff to look after Daniel and those other guys. And <laughs> please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water Daniel said, at the end of the ten days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food, then make your decision in the light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for ten days. Here comes the science project, guys. At the end of the ten days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nutrition than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. Right there, they just did a science project to prove fasting is actually healthier for you. And that was written way before even Jesus came to the earth, in that sense. But also, Daniel, he made this a lifestyle. You know I said he was in his youth right there? He wasn't an old man at this time. He was in his youth at this time. And he made this a lifestyle, not just a 21-day fast. It was actually a lifestyle for him to eat this way. And that's probably why he lived to be a lot of years old. <laughs> but we should try to fast more often to make it a lifestyle for us just that the healthy vegetable diet maybe we do the uh, one day eat normal the next day do the Daniel diet but make it a lifestyle but while doing that just don't make it a diet make it a commitment to the Lord make it uh, a dedication to the Lord say hey I'm going to do this so I can become closer to you so we can become close so now, if we were to add the statement at the beginning of the Chicago Tribune, and I edited a little bit, and it sounds a lot better this way. Fasting is a perfect way to introduce new healthy habits and God's spirit into your life. It can give you that jump start, boost clarity, and clear your body towards shifting things into a positive direction towards the kingdom of heaven. With the new lifestyle, you can watch the power of God work in your life. That's what I should have said. But when they don't add God into there, it changes the thing up a little bit. So what we need to do is focus on maybe doing a, I read another thing, it said they do a 5-2 diet, and that's eating normal five days, fasting two days, 
for me, that lifestyle, and the two days don't have to be on the weekends, it can be in the middle, it can just be wherever, but if you take those two days and seek God those two days and fast those two days, can you imagine the power that Jensen Franklin was talking about that could be in our lives by fasting daily, or no, not just every day, but fasting <laughs> once a week, fasting more often, and as God leads you to fast, fast, and abstain from food, it's actually more beneficial to you and healthy for your body. The second one I want to talk about is finances, resources that uh, he was talking about. And <laughs> I came across something else I wrote down in the Handy Dandy Journal, um, the Handy Dandy Notebook. <laughs> um, there's some clues in here I found. <laughs> but uh, it's a good idea. If you don't have a journal, get a journal and write down things. I got this journal uh, November 3rd, 2011, and the purpose was to do church notes. And then, uh, that's what I wrote up here, church notes. And then after having it for a while, and thoughts, prayers, God, and much, much more. Because it ended up being much, much more. Uh, but it's going to date this, and I'll put this down, because I was actually looking at this the other night, and I totally forgot about this fast here. Well, I did a three-day fast, and I wrote it down. Fast three days, water only. I wrote Wednesday, 9 o'clock at p.m. to August, 5th, or August 15th to Saturday, August 18th, 9 p.m. I wrote, I am fasting. I gave myself reasons to fast and what I was fasting for. To get closer to God, His will, to soften my heart, to love others, supernatural power through the Spirit, house, living place. And then I looked at that and I was like, whoa, I looked at the dates. Three months later, after the three-day fast, I finally got the house. We finally got a place to live. Also, three months later, I became a licensed minister in the Church of God. Obviously, I was doing steps towards that, but it's just... Awesome to see it written down, like, oh, I fasted and that's what happened. I'm getting closer to God because now I have to do more sermons, so I have to study more and I'm getting closer to God. <laughs> Doesn't matter how it happens, it's going to happen. And then uh, I wrote why I did this fast. And Jess Franklin talks about when you get led to do a fast, to do a fast. Well, I was just about to go to bed and I felt the need to just go read the Bible. And I didn't know what I was going to read, so I did Bible roulette. That's when you open the Bible up and just start reading. And I came across Esther and when she was fasting with the Jews for three days. And so I felt God leading me to a three-day fast. So that's what I wrote down. Also, I wrote day one, Thursday, day two, Friday, and day three, Saturday. Day one, my focus was going to be thanks and to get closer to God, to soften my heart, to love more, to be more loving. Day two, I wanted to have a focus so I knew what I was praying for. I pray for, this is just a light one, supernatural Holy Spirit, life-changing God, power, speaking in tongues, interpretation, healing, raising the dead, discernment, wisdom, and much, much more. And things. Okay. I figured if God wants to give me something, he can give it. me it all, or give me what he wants. <laughs> <laughs> so I gave him a choice there, you know, hey, go and have me. And then day three, also to study for the house, and thanks again. I wrote thanks on all that because I want to always thank God for what he's done in my life and what he's done for people around me. But uh, just looking at that, it's just, it's just amazing what God actually does for you when you fast. Well, on this fast, we've already heard some things I was praying about, and I was praying about getting uh, God's will in my life, and now I'm preaching every Wednesday. I pray for more finances and uh, resources and things like that. Well, well, I got it this last week. It wasn't much, but I ended up getting 15 hours of overtime. It's not the way I wanted to get more money. I wanted to go to the mailbox and get a check for $9 and say congratulations. I'm like, sweet, all right, I got it. No, I had to work for it, and I worked more hours, and then I worked other hours on top of that doing other side stuff. And then... After the bills were paid, I had a little extra than we normally did. And I haven't even got that paycheck that we got the extra money. That comes tomorrow, or Friday, I get the, the bigger paycheck. But after paying the bills, we had a little bit of extra money. It wasn't a lot more, but it was noticeable to say, hey, we got a couple extra bucks here. So God is doing it, and he's giving me a little bit more finances. No. And then I was able to take my wife to Red Lobster. I know it doesn't sound like the fast because you guys are doing a little bit different. <laughs> Um, I still didn't have coffee or tea yet, so we're good there. Um, but I did the, the two, day, two meals I fast, and then the next meal I can eat. Well, I walked out of Red Lobster with only paying $40. That's a miracle in itself. <laughs> One, 
think there's a life got potato soup and a drink. <laughs> and then I, I didn't get an appetizer and I only got a water also. So that was exciting. I was like, wow, that was with a seven dollar tip too. Uh, <laughs> I was like, yeah. But the next topic I want to talk about is more God. Because that's what I think we all need. Even pastors, we all need more God. And it's funny because I didn't even watch this video yet before I was uh, oh actually um Marty had got me a new Bible, it was an ESV version, because I didn't have one yet, and he just handed me it, and so what yeah. I do, instead of putting it on the shelf, I actually opened it up and read it, and I opened it up to Job 23, and I just read one verse, and that's where most of these handwritten notes come from, it's just that verse, and I just kept going, and I hadn't even planned on writing anything at that moment, and uh, we'll go ahead and go into that part. It's uh, Job 23, 1 through 7. Then Job spoke again. Yeah. And that's what got me. No, that's not what I'm doing. My complaint today is still a bitter one. And I try hard not to groan aloud. <coughs> if only I knew where to find God, I would go to his throne and talk with him there. I would lay out my case and present my arguments. Then I... I would listen to his reply yeah, and understand right. what he says to me. This is actually what got me right. Would he merely argue with me in his greatness? No. He would give me a fair hearing. In the other version it says he would pay attention to me. Verse 7. Fair and honest people can reason with him, so I would be acquitted by my judge. And then in verse 12, I, I went down and I read it a little bit more, and this got me too. I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his word more than daily food. Sounds like a fast to me. Verse 6 says, Will he plead against me with his great power? Rather, would he contend against me in his greatness of his power? That is, would he crush me by mere strength and force? Would he use against me that overwhelming might? which he possesses. No, Job answers, certainly not, but the word of, uh, but he would put strength in me, or rather, but he would give heed to me. He would pay attention to me and my cause. We need more God in our lives. And like I said, it's not just for the congregation, it's for preachers, it's for pastors, it's for everybody. I think we all need more God. And who can go wrong with more God? Job understood this in Job 23, 12, and he says, I have not departed from his commands, but have treasured his words more than daily food. Talk about being lovesick. Jensen talk, Frank was talking about they're at the dinner table at restaurants that are just talking and enjoying each other's presence rather than the food. Here's Job saying, I treasured his word more than the food. So he's seeking the word rather than eating. He's, he's fasting to be closer to God, to seek God, and he's saying he treasures that moment. We need this kind of longing for God. He treasures God's word more than food, and I just said that. <laughs> Here goes technology, right? Well, with the technology, we can have the Bible on us at all times. I would suggest we read the Bible at all times also, and start treasuring it like a rare item. Read it like you only have a few days left and there will be no more Bibles around, which we know it says we're going to go on forever and ever. But if we start having that mentality that this could be gone at any moment, we're going to start reading that thing like it's a treasure. 23.6, he would pay attention to me. That's what got me. God would pay attention to me. And I actually wrote this before Sandy spoke on Sunday, which is kind of awesome when she wrote that, so I wanted to do a side note with her in there. God is paying attention to me, even in his busy schedule. As Sandy said Sunday morning during children's communion, God takes time, even with what's going on in Israel and the Islamic fightings and the big events, the war that's going around, the tsunamis and everything. The God that is taking care of all that still has time for me, individually and personally has time for me. And he's still doing it like this with this cup. In the midst of all that, he takes time to say, hey, your mind. So then, why in America, mostly here in America, 
We're always trying to keep up with the Joneses. We try to have a good looking car, the best looking house, the best looking lawn, the trophy wife, the, the fame, the glory, the money. We're always trying to seek all this so that the world can look at us and say, they're not even jumping to their knees when they say, wow, they're just, actually, <laughs> they're probably more bad at you than anything, to be honest. They're not, <laughs> they probably want to kill you, take your wife, take your house, take your car, drive her off a cliff, jump out of it, and say, ha, there's your car, there's your thing. So I don't even know why we're trying to go after all this. But we want to fit in. So when we're younger, we go to parties, and or older, and we want to fit in, so we see people smoke, hey, smoke. So we start smoking, and they're drinking, and we want to be in the cool crowd, so we drink. We take a hit from a joint so we can fit in, so that group will pay attention to us. What kind of group is that? They don't have anything to offer but temporarily moments of joy, and if not death and just a bad slate of hell. But the God, the Creator, the God that created you is already paying attention to you, just the way you are. You do not have to do anything to get God's attention because you already have it. So instead of wasting temporarily time with the wor world, let's try to impress God. Let's already seek His love that He's already seeking for us. He wants a relationship with us, and He wants to adopt us in as his, He wants to be our Father if we don't have a Father. He wants to be all of that. And we don't have to impress Him. He's not going to tell us to do something dangerous. God is asking for you to love Him because He loves you. And he's not going to ask you to do anything. Plus, he will never leave you nor forsake you. I read this this morning after I had wrote that. And I read the second chapter of the book. And I was thinking about continuing on to this. And I still might because it's some good stuff in here. But this whole point I was talking about, he writes right here. The point is that God loves you and me because he chooses to. Get rid of the twisted thinking that God loves you because he saw something in you that attracted him. That may be the way human relationships work. God cares for me because I am a hard worker or a caring neighbor or a faithful patient. Wrong! He loves you because he chooses to. At first, that's hard to take in. I want God to care for me because he really likes me. But if God only loves you because of who you are, then we have to lie to ourselves about who we are in order to receive that care. He doesn't love you any more or any less because of who you are or what you do. He loves you to the max simply because it's in His mercy and He chooses to. Do you see how feeling freeing that is? Any risk you have of losing God's love goes out the window. You can never be outside His circle of love because it's all it's not about you, it's about Him. That's comforting for me. Because I've done a lot of stupid things. A lot of good things to me. I've done some little good things. Okay, a couple of things that are good. <laughs> but he'll never leave you nor forsake you. Deuteronomy 31.6 So be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. And do not panic before them. For the Lord your God will personally go ahead of you. And he will neither fail you nor abandon you. And that was in time of battle. But we're not all in battles. We're in different battles. We're in spiritual battles like Jensen Franklin said. And I have spoke before also. We are in that spiritual battle, and the best way to take on that spiritual battle is <laughs> dropping to our knees, abstaining from food, and seeking God's face. Also, people will do harmful things to themselves to seek attention of others. I was watching a thing where gang members, they killed somebody so they can get their highest status in life to be worthy of that gang. So they just went out and killed a random person so that they can get that higher status. Others will, will cut themselves and try to get attention from their parents and friends and do outrageous things. There's a movie out there called Jack Donkey. Well, it's a three-letter word for the donkey. Um, and I have not seen this because I've heard of things that have gone on in that movie that are just ridiculous things that do for attention. But one of them they did that uh, it's G-rated. Oh, it's kind of crappy, actually. Uh, they got a portal potty, shut themselves in there, put a pair of goggles on, and they had someone roll it. And it was full of crap. So he's rolling around a poop. He's in a poop of body, going to pull him down. Everyone, I'm like, oh, wow, I want to be your friend. Yeah. Oh. I'm like, come on, what are we? We don't have to do that for God. <laughs> we go through a lot of crap before we get to God. 
But God will take care of all that. But the Lord is saying, here's my hand. Take hold of that hand. That's all he's saying. It's like if we're running away from God. And I did that video a long time ago when Pastor said he ran from God no matter how far. When he turned back around, God was right there. I have a vision of God's hand right here. So no matter how fast I run, it's still right there. No matter where I go or hide, as soon as I turn around, it's still right there reaching for me. And he says, take my hand, and then all we have to do is say, I want that water that I'll never thirst from. In John 4, 14, but those who drink the water I give will never be thirsty again. It becomes a fresh bubbling spring within them, giving them eternal life. So, that's amazing right there too, because I'm thirsty <laughs> for, for water and thirsty for God more. <laughs> I also read something that was intriguing. It said, the only man-made thing in heaven will be Jesus' scars on his hands and feet. <laughs> I came up with the only perfect, imperfect, perfect thing in heaven will be Jesus' hands and feet scarred. And he will do that so that when we go to heaven, we'll know that it was him that did that for us. We'll know what he endured on earth for us. And the pain, he felt all that pain. And also, when I was looking into this, uh, it touched my heart a little bit. But our God is a God that will give us great riches. He is not a moocher. He is a giver. He gave His Spirit to us when Jesus had left. We always have that one person that will come over, hey, I, can I, well, you guys want to eat, well, you know, whatever. God's not going to do that. He's going to give to you. Matthew 7, 11. So if you sinful people know how much to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give good gifts to those who ask Him? God will always be that for you. He's going to be that friend there for life. In John 15, 15 it says, I no longer call you slaves because a master does not confide in slaves. Now you are my friends since I have told you everything the Father had told me. Jesus said, hey, I'm your friend. And he's a real friend. He's a true friend. He has already called us friends of God. He has already chosen us. It doesn't matter our lifestyles at first. God wants to take you in as you are now, then mold you later, and to make you pure and holy and his friend. He is power, wealth. He is a king. His kingdom has streets of gold. His gates, his fence is of pearls. He has legions of angels as protection. So we do not need to be afraid because he has the safe place for us. And that safe place is in his arms. He loved us so much that he died for us. And I'll preach this every time I come up here. John 3.16 For God so loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. And I got a new perspective on this after reading it again. God not only gave his son to die in our place, but he himself also died on the cross for us, because if they are both one, then they both laid their lives for us that day. John 10, 30 simply says, the Father and I are one. So I was looking at that. I haven't really studied it that much. I just got that and it's, wow. God himself and his son died on the cross for us. Not just one was beaten, but both were beaten. Both took on the sin of the world for us. As Jensen Franklin said, we should be lovesick with God. We, shouldn't, or we should want more of him. God has done all the reaching out to us. Let's serve a God that has more to offer than any earthly friend can ever possibly even imagine. He has lasting gifts. His kingdom has mansions for you. And he has been preparing for over 2,000 years. John 14, 3. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. For 2,000 years now, he's been preparing a place for you. He's been that molding on. He's putting that trim on. He's hanging those pictures. He's setting up people waiting to meet you that have influenced your life. People that you've influenced their lives have gone on before you. They're waiting there to meet you there. But before you or I even said yes, he prepared that place for us. He has that place in heaven. It's, and he also has a predestined plan for us, every one of us. And it's a life full of rewards. But we first must take his hand and say yes. 
Then we must stay on task and remember Matthew 28, 20. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of age. Our God has been paying attention to us already before we had even gone on to do anything great for Him. He was paying attention to us when we were yet sinners. And that's the God that's paying attention to the whole world. He's got the whole palm in His hand, the whole world in His palm in His hands. <laughs> He's got His palm in His hand too. <laughs> Just so you guys were wondering. But this is the God that I want more of. And He's already calling us to have more of Him. It's just us to take His hand.